Today's presentation is titled Outlook for MedTech Companies in the Trump Era, What's Happening on the Hill and What It Means for Life Sciences. I'm Courtney Young, an attorney in Medmark's risk management department. On behalf of Medmark and today's presenter, Clayton Hall, thank you for joining us. Clayton Hall is the Vice President of Government Affairs at the Medical Device Manufacturers Association. Prior to joining MDMA, Mr. Hall spent 12 years working on Capitol Hill and served as Chief of Staff to three members of the U.S. House of Representatives, former Congressman Jim McCreary Joseph and Joseph Cal, and Congressman Tim Griffin. McCreary and Griffin both served on the powerful Ways and Means Committee, the Chief Tax Writing Committee in the House, which has significant jurisdiction over federal health care policy. Clayton managed a diverse portfolio of political and policy issues while he was on the Hill, playing a major role in drafting numerous pieces of legislation including legislation to reform the federal regulatory regime and Medicare payment policies. He received a Bachelor of Science degree in Economics from Washington and Lee University in Virginia. With that, I am pleased to turn things over to Clayton who will begin today's presentation. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Heather, for the invitation, and thank all of you for joining us for the call. Uh, I am going to, I hope to, uh, through this presentation, help illuminate for you um, uh, you know, what's happened in the first half of the year, and now as we enter kind of the third quarter of the year, what we can expect to happen for the end of the year. Obviously, uh, with a new administration, there has been lots of change in Washington. Uh, this is certainly an unorthodox administration, uh, and because of that, um, you know, it, it, is, it, it is difficult in some ways to kind of guess uh, but we will do our best to kind of walk through uh, what we see as the state of the state of play for this year and certainly the new administration's impact on the legislative agenda here in Congress. So a little bit about MDMA first. Uh, the Medical Device Manufacturers Association was founded in 1992 by a handful of really smaller uh, medical device executives who were seeking a voice in Washington. Uh, today we've grown to about 300 member companies. Um, again, the sweet spot for us is the entrepreneurial uh, company. We certainly represent, though, a number of, uh, of, of mid-sized companies uh, and, and uh, a few of the uh, larger companies. Uh, but our DNA, again, is that entrepreneurial company, uh, venture-backed, uh, that, is, that is developing uh, new therapies to bring to market. Uh, we are able to leverage the collective resources of all those member companies to provide uh, what we believe is top-tier advocacy on behalf of those companies in front of uh, the administration uh, and in front of Congress. And we also obviously provide uh, educational uh, assistance to those companies about what's happening in D.C. and how it could impact their business. Uh, and we have a really strong record of success that we're proud of and we can talk about and explore a little bit more uh, in a second. In terms of the agenda for today's call, we'll, we'll, we will revisit uh, the 2016 elections, talk about how that impacts the current state of play here in Washington. Uh, we'll chat a little bit about uh, the Republican efforts uh, to repeal and replace uh, the Affordable Care uh, Act. Uh, we'll chat about the device tax, its status, uh, uh, tax reform, uh, the user fee agreements, which were just signed into law, a little bit about the challenges in the reimbursement space, and uh, we'll close uh, with a quick discussion on cost of care and the value of technology. So the 2016 elections, um, unorthodox for sure. Uh, we uh, added, uh, this, this slide is titled, Another Dewey Defeats Truman. So uh, famously in the, during the 1948 elections, the night before the election, the Chicago Tribune uh, printed uh, several hundred copies before they were able to fix it, calling the race uh, for uh, Truman's opponent, uh, Dewey. Uh, a couple of days later, and you've probably seen the famous picture, uh, President Truman, Truman is on the back of his uh, train returning to Washington, grinning, uh, you know, smile ear to ear, holding up the newspaper. And, you know, they got it wrong, and a lot of people got it wrong in that election, and a lot of people got it wrong in this last election. So much so that heading into election day, the night before the election, uh, the leading, I would say, political, not typically a poll, he's not really a pollster, he's an economist, I think, by background, but Nate Silver, who had become uh, one of the top political pundits following the 2008 election, when he called 48 out of 50 states correctly, um, uh, he, he was, th these are his numbers uh, for the expectation. So he pegged it at 71% chance that Hillary Clinton would win. Now, if he were on the call right now, he'd say, I got it right. 
You know, there was a 30% chance that Trump would win, and he won. Uh, so I factored that in. Uh, but, you know, all of the forecasters were really pegging this to be a Clinton victory. Uh, some of the forecasts had it as high as 90% heading into Election Day. Uh, part of that was Trump was polling at about 42%. That was the lowest uh, a major po uh, political party candidate for president had polled since Bob Dole in 1996. But what did they miss? And I think part of what the forecasters missed was that there was a huge chunk of undecided voters, 12% uh, of folks heading into the election day, either were truly undecided or would not tell uh, pollsters who they were voting for. And that was just 3% in 2012. So you had tons of variance in kind of where folks could go. And how did Trump win? Well, you know, he wasn't given a shot uh, when he announced uh, for president. There was a really a packed field of Republicans. There were, including himself, there were 12 major Republican candidates. He, he was the only one that had never held elected office. Uh, I think most people kind of dismissed him as a P.T. Barnum type and didn't take his candidacy very seriously. What he was able to do successfully is leverage that outsider role against a number of career politicians and vanquish all of them uh, in, 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 in route to capturing the Republican nomination. And he basically used the same playbook against Hillary Clinton, who was coming off of a very difficult primary, primary herself. So it was really the outsider versus a career politician. Clinton, if you'll recall, had been first lady uh, beginning in 1979 of Arkansas, played a very outsized kind of policy role in her husband's administrations in Arkansas. 92, she's first lady. Uh, here at the White House, 2002 Senator of New York, 2008 presidential candidate, unsuccessful, 2009 through 13 the Secretary of State for President Obama, and then 2016 uh, really ordained the moment that she announced as being kind of the Democrat uh, candidate for, uh, for president. So, uh, you know, ultimately, and I think this is mostly because public trust right now in terms of in, in major institutions like the media, uh, public trust in the government are at all-time lows. And for the first time in the history of polling, the majority of Americans now say that their kids will be worse off than them. Uh, and that's, that's really shocking. That's kind of always been the great American promise that the next generation is, able, is going to be able to surpass the generation before them. Uh, and part of that is because real wages really haven't grown in decades for, for a number of folks. So you had this, I think, disillusionment uh, with, with certainly with Congress, um, with political leaders in general, uh, and Donald Trump as an outsider was able to become and, you know, really frame himself as the candidate for change. How do you win when we look at the states? You, what you'll see on your, the left there is uh, the, the electoral votes. This was a pretty large electoral vote win. He won by a margin, he won by 74 total electoral votes. Uh, 38 votes were the difference had they swung either way. And the places where you'll see that he won uh, were in the rust, rust, rust Belt. So Wisconsin hadn't been won by a Republican since 1984. Michigan uh, and Pennsylvania had not been won by Republicans since 1988. Ohio had gone for, uh, for uh, President Obama twice. Uh, and then obviously he won swing states uh, like Florida, North Carolina, uh, and Iowa. But just in that Rust Belt, that was a total of 70 electoral votes. Um, you know, in hindsight, I think the, the Clinton camp, and, and he won by narrow margins in many of those places. Uh, in hindsight, the Clinton campaign, which had started toying with trying to run up and win places like Texas, uh, win places like Arizona, uh, I think would have spent more time in the Rust Belt, which, is, uh, you know, some in the campaign may have taken for granted. Um, so when you think about what motivates Trump, um, it's going to be those states, those Rust Belt states, um, the, you know, non college-educated white voters, many of whom have been left behind by uh, trade agreements that they think favored other countries, where manufacturing has largely been lost. Uh, and so the policy should be driven by the politics uh, and his desire to keep those states in the red column. Uh, in terms of the Senate, heading into the election, I think most people felt like the Senate would flip. Uh, there were 54 Republicans heading into the election. They only lost two seats. Uh, they lost a New Hampshire seat, Kelly Ayotte, and in Illinois, uh, Mark Kirk. Uh, they were expected to, to likely lose seats in Ohio, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, all of which they won, uh, and, uh, and in the toss-up states of Florida, Indiana, and Missouri to get a scare, they held all of those. So what you have now is a very narrow majority, but still a majority uh, in the Senate. And in the House, that, that big red map down uh, at the bottom right, 
Uh, Republicans were coming off of their largest majority, I think, in about a century. Uh, they lost six seats, were expected again to lose more. But that really doesn't tell you the whole story. When you look at that map of the House, uh, they are sitting on a – they can only lose 23 Republicans on any given vote and still carry the vote with 218 Republicans. There are 24 Republicans that are now sitting in districts that Clinton won. So those are very difficult decisions for those members to you know, vote with their party or vote against their party. And now there are 32 members of the far right wing of the Republican Party known as the Freedom Caucus. And there's constant tension between the, the, the Tuesday group and the more moderate members, many of whom are in these Clinton seats, uh, and then the strident uh, conservatives and the Freedom Caucus. And that has created, uh, I think, some, certainly a lot of tension uh, and challenges when Republican leadership are trying to pass uh, their agenda uh, and the president's agenda. So Republicans swept the election. They have unified government, uh, but there's, it's still very much an open question about you know, whether they have a governing majority. So the agenda, uh, Trump ran on you know, repealing and replacing the Affordable Care Act, uh, lowering corporate taxes and individual taxes, uh, regulatory relief, uh, reducing the size of the government, you know, remaking and reshaping the Supreme Court, uh, immigration reform, border security, huge infrastructure investments, you know, America first energy policy, and revisiting all of these uh, multilateral international free trade agreements uh, so that, you know, and repositioning the U.S. Uh, in a, in a, to, to win some of those agreements. Um, that's, that's an amb ambitious agenda, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an open question of kind of where we are in all this. Obviously, he's, he, with the Neil Gorsuch nomination to the Supreme Court, that's clearly in the win column. Uh, the, the, the efforts to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act uh, failed uh, earlier this summer, um, and, and now there's a pivot probably towards tax reform, which is also going to have its own challenges. And he's still, it, it feels like, you know, when I talk to friends, I think most people feel like we're well into the Trump administration. It's constant news coverage. He's in a constant battle with the press. Um, they kind of feed off of one another. You cannot turn on the TV without hearing about the Trump administration. We are, in, we are on, today is day 215. Uh, that's basically, we're about 15% uh, into his term. And if you, wanna, if, you want, if you like baseball analogies, we're at the top of the second inning. Um, that said, although it is early, uh, there are lots of threats to the president's agenda, uh, especially for it being this early. Uh, and those are controversy. Uh, he, he, he seems to thrive on controversy. Uh, the ongoing investigation of the Russian interference in the election is kind of a cloud that has been over this administration. I think clearly the administration um, uh, feels like uh, uh, they that 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 they are questioning the, the media and Democrats are questioning the legitimacy of his victory. Uh, so that's created, uh, in some sense, a paranoia about the Russian investigation. They insist that there was no collusion. Um, uh, but, you know, the president and some of his actions are actually probably making the situation a little bit worse. Firing uh, Comey, the FBI director, ultimately led now to a special counsel uh, and the former F headed by the former FBI director, who is a friend of Comey, um, uh, Mr. Mueller, and he's staffing up a large team that is going after uh, and chasing down every piece of evidence to see where this may lead. Uh, they have already um, uh, recently they got an order to search uh, Paul Manafort, the former Trump uh, campaign manager's home, uh, for evidence. So it is unlikely that that just goes quietly into the night. And that is only one investigation. There are separate investigations in the U.S. House of Representatives and in the Senate. So that's not going away anytime soon. And then we have the Charlottesville controversy that started last week. The president has now gone into TV four or five times uh, in efforts to try to clean up the mess that, was, that, that many perceive that he made, uh, having waited, you know, been criticized for waiting too long to come out and condemn uh, the, uh, the Nazi um, and KKK and white supremacist movement um, in, uh, that, that were largely responsible for the death of the protester in Charlottesville. He made comments about um, uh, there were many sides, uh, that, that there were very fine people on both sides, suggesting that, uh, that within the, the, the racist groups that were there in Charlottesville, there were fine people amongst them. Uh, and that has set off a fire uh, across the country, um, an, an enormous controversy that he just can't seem to get himself out of. 
um, and, and at every turn seems to make it clear that he condemns racism, uh, but then will point out that the other side has bad guys too. And so uh, it's not going away, and he hasn't been able to demonstrate his ability to kind of to, to clean that up and walk away from it. So it is consuming a ton of time and energy and resources and really pitting, um, uh, really politicizing and the, the polarization that already exists in our country uh, and, and, and flaming uh, uh, his, um, uh, uh, you know, his, uh, those that, uh, that oppose his administration. So I don't know that any of that goes away anytime soon, and the longer that it's out there, it's going to really create um, a problem for his agenda. Obviously, that's impacting his approval numbers. He is at a historical low approvals. We'll dive into those in a second. Uh, but the base is still with him, so that's important to know. Then the White House itself is in, is in massive transition. They've lost most of their senior staff, um, and in terms of the key political appointees, Across the government, there are 577 positions that require Senate confirmation. Those really should be, you know, Trump loyalists who come into the federal government, help him shape policy within, within, within the administration across all of the branches of the executive branch. Uh, they have only confirmed 117 of those positions. They only have nominations for another 107, and there are 354 of those positions that remain completely open with no nominees having been submitted to the U.S. Senate. That's going to create a real problem in terms of the president being able to execute on his agenda even within his own executive branch. Uh, and, and there aren't, you know, again, Trump was an outsider. He, did, he, did, he wasn't a typical party candidate, so he doesn't have a ton of loyalists who are also experienced and have worked in government or worked in previous administrations that are willing to jump in and help him out. So, you know, where do they find those people? Um, and that's an open question. And then obviously the escalating tensions with Congress. Uh, you know, Trump uh, in his past had, had, had donated uh, politically to Democrats, including uh, Secretary Clinton, um, so he didn't have strong relationships uh, with the Republican Party, wasn't seen as a as an I Republican ideologue. Uh, and really has been, you know, ramping up not just his attacks on Democrats in Congress, but attacks on key Republicans, and that's going to be a challenge for him uh, if he hopes to get some legislative victories uh, notched on his belt here soon. In terms of approval, these are his first 200 days in office. He was never a popular candidate. You'll see that he's never been above 50 uh, since he entered office. He was never, well, he, I don't know that he ever broke 50. If he did, it was only momentarily when he was a candidate. And you'll see it drop from there. So currently he's at about 34%. I've seen some polls today that have him around 38 or 39. Bottom line is, uh, you know, he's got 79% of Republicans who are still with him, uh, but 7% of Democrats uh, and only a third of independents. And independents have really become key to winning national elections, and they aren't with him. Um, most importantly, he's below 40% in those key states that I talked, described to you earlier, the Rust Belt states, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. He can't stay at that number absent something really, you know, uh, it would be unprecedented for him to stay at those numbers in those states and expect to win them uh, when he faces reelection. Uh, and then uh, where does he compare to other presidents? So Obama was at about 53% at this point in his presidency. Bush was up there at 65. Clinton was at 44. He came in a bit stronger, but the economy started to tank, uh, and what has now been coined Hillary Care at this point was starting to tank too, and that was a drag. Uh, but he recovers a little bit, and he's low. I talked to you about the team. This is a remarkable photo. Some of you may have seen this. It's been, um, uh, it's been out in the press for the past week. Uh, these are his senior staff uh, on day one. So Reince Priebus, his chief of staff, Steve Bannon, his chief strategist, uh, Sean Spicer, his communications director slash press secretary, and Michael Flynn, his national security advisor. As of today, uh, and with Steve Bannon's firing last week, none of these people are around anymore his entire senior team are gone. Now, surely he depends on others in the White House that are still there, like his family members, uh, the, uh, the NEC chairman, Gary Cohn. So he still has supports, but this is fairly remarkable. I mean, it's, it really is unprecedented. I, there, I, I doubt there's been a presidential administration, certainly in modern history, that has lost four of their top senior folks in a matter of months, uh, within a matter of months of assuming office. Now, his legislative strategy is going to depend on his success in Congress, and his success in Congress is going to depend on his success in the Senate. And those numbers, as I told you, are already very tight. To move most pieces of legislation in the Senate, you need 60 votes. Um, he has 52 Republicans and cannot count on all 52 of those votes. 
not only that, his relationships are probably on pretty shaky ground with a number of key senators. I've listed 12 here, the first being the Senate Majority Leader, Senator McConnell, without whom he will be unable to move anything. Uh, and it's been reported, as I think last night, that, that he and the Senate Majority Leader have not spoken in weeks, and that the last discussion that they had was over the phone, and, uh, and that, the, that, it was, that the, the president was screaming profanities at the, at, the, at, the, at the leader. The leader now says that he questions, at least in private company, what's being reported, he questions the, the ability of the president to, to accomplish anything legislatively. That's pretty stark. Uh, Senator John McCain, um, who voted against the health care bill, as did the next two that you see here, uh, you know, during the campaign, he criticized John McCain for not being a war hero because he was captured during the war. Uh, you see here uh, Senator Snow, Senator Murkowski, there are two moderates. Both of them voted against the health care bill. Uh, he has been critical of both. Senator Flake, who is in Arizona, who's a, who is a conservative and votes with the president 93% of the time. Uh, last night in front of his crowd uh, in Arizona, he called him weak on immigration and weak on crime. Uh, and he has just, just stopped short of endorsing his primary candidate. That, I can't think of that ever happening. Um, uh, a sitting president of the same party endorsing a primary opponent to a sitting U.S. senator. Um, one would think that, that most people would recognize that really puts in jeopardy uh, your ability to get things done in D.C. And then Senator Heller, who he also threatened during the health care revote uh, from, um, from Nevada. These two senators, Flake and, and, and Nevada, will make or break potentially the Senate majority, Republican Senate majority. They are t the two most vulnerable Republicans up for re-election. And it, it has yet to be seen that the president is willing or capable of supporting their elections. Senator Graham from South Carolina has gotten into a spat with the president over the past week. We have Ted Cruz who the president called affectionately lying Ted Cruz during the campaign. Rand Paul, he had a number of skirmishes with uh, during the campaign. Marco Rubio, at one point kind of the future of the party. Uh, he called Little Marco during the campaign. Ben Sass, also considered one of the young stars in the party um, and potentially a candidate for president in the future, although they haven't had you know, as many public squabbles I don't know that there is a lot of love there. And then Senator Corker, who was considered a favorite candidate for Secretary of State last week, uh, was quoted uh, as saying that he questioned basically whether the, he, I think he said that the, the president lacked stability and competence to, to succeed. So th these are real serious challenges uh, to the president as he tries to move an agenda through the Senate. Now this was supposed to, what you see here are the Senate Democrats who are up for re-election uh, in 2018, and how Trump performed in their states. And this should have been a strength for the Trump presidency coming in. You have 10, uh, from Joe Manchin all the way down to Debbie Stabenow in Michigan, you have 10 Democrat senators in states that Trump won. Five of them, Joe Manchin, Hyde Camp, Tester, Donnelly, McCaskill, are in states that Trump won by 19 points or more. In Traditionally, you would expect that those senators are clamoring for ways to demonstrate to their constituents that they can partner with a president who won their state really big. Uh, and so far, there's been zero of that. Um, and part of that is, you know, is as, as well as he did in their states, um, I think most of these senators, he's incredibly unpopular with Democrats at 7%, so they've got to keep their base uh, politically for their reelects. Um, and, and, you know, there's been, he, he, you know, last night he called them socialists, the Democrats, Senate Democrats. So there's not, there hasn't been a real effort to develop relationships with Democrats. Um, and there's not, and because of all that and the uncertainty in the political environment, Republicans have had, I think, admittedly a tough time finding um, serious contenders for each of these seats. So, that, so they don't feel, um, these senators may not feel under as much political pressure as they otherwise should. So that's the context of where we are in terms of, you know, the po political dynamics in Congress in Washington, D.C. right now. And by the way, there's a lot that Congress has to do. So, it, you know, in the face of all those challenges, Congress has a really full plate this fall. You'll see all the must-pass legislation that they have to pass, uh, likely bills that they need to consider, and then things that are possible that have been, you know, priorities, but, you know, maybe if we can get to them. The ones I want to point out to you, the debt limit, so, you know, unless they, unless Congress extends the debt limit, we could default, uh, the U.S. could default on their debt. The spending bill, unless Congress passes a new spending bill, you could have a government shutdown. In fact, the, the President last night suggested that 
absent funding for a border wall as part of these spending bills that he welcomed a government shutdown. Uh, and then you have the CHIP reauthorization for children's health care uh, that has to be reauthorized before the end of the month. The most likely scenario, Congress is only here this month, the House I think 14 days. Um, so it is unlikely that they're going to be able to pass uh, and get through the Senate um, anything short of, you know, punts on each of these, so short extensions uh, that line everything up for the end of the year for probably a large package that would likely have lots of policy riders, but will have to be bipartisan in nature. So we expect, again, the Congress most likely on these issues will, will extend them until the end of the year and then deal with them as part of a large package together at the end of the year. Um, you know, Republicans are also eager to get off of health care. So, uh, you know, there's other than an effort in the U.S. Senate, uh, which we can talk, we'll talk about more in more detail to kind of deal with market stabilization and the president's demands that they return to the repeal of Obamacare. There's not a huge appetite to do that. It, it, it was a tough road for them. It became a bit of an albatross around their neck. And I think they want to move to tax reform, and that's certainly what they've been positioning themselves to do. Tax reform, though, is also very challenging, but they've got to pass something, something big. All of these members know they've got to pass something and pass something big as they head into their reelections next year. So we're going to be on the lookout for, for movement on tax reform, uh, as difficult as that may be. And then in terms of kind of discrete health care legislation, um, you know, Congress passed the Cures Bill at the end of last year uh, that advances life sciences writ large across the federal government, new funding for NIH, and a number of new provisions uh, to, um, uh, uh, to improve the FDA. Uh, then most recently they just passed and signed into law the user fee agreement. So those are really two big landmark pieces of, of health, uh, health bills. Uh, other than that and other than the ones we've mentioned up here, the CHIP reauthorization, um, maybe something on market stabilization, uh, Medicare extenders. We may see some action on bills to further address the opio opioid epidemic, uh, uh, right to try legislation, uh, lab, the regulation of lab developed tests, although that gets kind of tricky, uh, lots of interest in cyber secure, healthcare cybersecurity, and probably not going to see it this year, but an issue that's been popping up in the House, the issue of off-label promotion. And happy to answer any questions about that at the end of the presentation. Let's dive into what happened with health care. Um, heading into this year, I think everyone expected that it would be difficult, but that with a unified Republican government, uh, that there would be health care reform and that there would be a wholesale repeal of the Affordable Care Act and something to replace it. Um, there are about, if, and, and, and to put this all in context, it's kind of, it's, you know, let's, let's talk about where the Affordable Care Act is now. Uh, you know, the bottom line is there are 25 million more Americans that roughly, depending on when you capture this data, who now have health care through the Affordable Care Act. Most of that coverage was provided through Medicaid expansion and through CHIP. That number is somewhere around 15 million. Uh, and, and somewhere between 10, I think right now it's about 10 million people receive uh, subsidies and purchase uh, insurance through the individual exchange. Um, that dropped the uninsured rate from a high of about 16% to about 11% last year. So anything that tries to get in there and tinker with it, you are messing with these numbers, right? Um, uh, but, you know, that, you do that at great political peril, but, the, but there are problems and failures with the Affordable Care Act, um, and the, exchanges, the exchange markets are becoming increasingly unstable. Uh, there are third of counties in the, in the U.S. that only have one plan. Uh, you see, you know, we're seeing premium, annual premium hikes, average annual premium hikes of 20%, and some places 50 to 100% premiums are skyrocketing. And you see large insurance carriers like, like Aetna that are, that are fleeing the exchange markets. So there has to be something to stabilize the market, or as the President has suggested, uh, it may fall apart on its own. Uh, Interestingly, though, the more that Congress has turned its attention to repealing and replacing the Affordable Care Act, public support is, is at an all-time high. So uh, the Affordable Care Act was a huge drag politically on Democrats. They lost, uh, uh, certainly lost the House uh, majority over it, uh, lost the Senate majority over this issue, and, uh, and it helped uh, uh, enable Trump to win the presidency. But as soon as now Congress starts looking at it, it becomes more popular. Here's the timeline. I put this here just to show you that this, look at the enormous amount of time that was spent in Congress 
focusing on health care this year. You had, um, at the beginning of the year, Congress quickly uh, uh, passed budget resolutions that would put in process the way for them to pass the repeal and replace. Um, you have, in March, you have the committees of jurisdiction pass uh, through partisan votes, uh, respective legislation, moves to the House floor, the House pulls it because they don't have the votes, and then by um, uh, the hair on their chinny-chin-chin, chin, they pass it by a narrow vote. Uh, I think this was by two-vote margin, 270 to 213 in May. Kick it over to the Senate. The Senate starts their own process, uh, lots of fits and starts, pulling bills, uh, revising bills, and finally, uh, Leader McConnell says, you know what, whether or not we have the votes, I'm bringing this to the floor to force a vote. Uh, ultimately, that was unsuccessful. Uh, and on July 28th, his legislation, the uh, Health Care Freedom Act, uh, which was ended up being just a vehicle for them, which was a much smaller uh, bill than the House bill, and really a vehicle for them to go to conference to put together a bill with the House, uh, that failed by a vote of 49 to 51. Uh, and I mentioned to you those three senators who voted against it. So where do they go from here? I mean, McConnell's basically said, we're not going back to this until – Others can convince me we have 50 votes for something, uh, which is the minimum uh, Vice President Pence would then come in and be the deciding vote. Um, so, you know, the President keeps calling for uh, taking another bite of this apple. I, I don't know that there's a tremendous amount of enthusiasm for doing that. I think Republicans in Congress, for the reasons we've discussed earlier, are ready to move to tax reform. But we could see something in the very near future, the health committee, the health care committee on the Senate side, uh, which is chaired by uh, Senator Alexander from Tennessee, uh, and the ranking member, Senator Murray, from, uh, from Washington. Both of them have worked in a bipartisan way on lots of big bills. They're going to start having hearings when Congress gets back in September to look at ways to stabilize the market. Uh, and so that's, you know, potentially funding things like the CSRs, these, uh, you know, the, the cost-sharing uh, subsidies that go back to the states, uh, I'm sorry, to insurers, um, uh, potentially ways to, you know, additional waivers, to allow states to have more flexibility in the way that they run their insurance markets and their Medicaid programs. Uh, but, you know, again, likelihood of that passing, it's going to be tough. You know, I don't, I don't think there will be enough Republican votes for that to pass overwhelmingly, but maybe there are enough Democrats to help carry the day if that is something that, that Congress feels compelled to do. But we're watching that closely. Uh, again, it's just around the corner. Um, ultimately, you know, the Medicaid reforms that were proposed both under the House bill and the Senate bill uh, caused a lot of heartburn uh, with Republican members. Lots of Republican governors came out opposing the cuts to Medicaid. Um, and then the CBO, which is Congress's, um, uh, the, the agency within Congress that scores the impact of legislation, the budgetary impact of legislation, they scored most of these bills as having, you know, basically wiping out the coverage gains of the Affordable Care Act. Um, so that caused a lot of heartburn. Um, so, again, I don't think we're going to see much more in terms of uh, big health care this year. That could change on a dime, but, but not expected. Uh, in terms of uh, the device tax, the device tax for those and for, 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 for every company that's, that is selling, that has product uh, that has been approved by the FDA, that is on market, that is selling product, um, you know, except for very few products that are really over-the-counter in nature, uh, they were taxed under the Affordable Care Act's medical device tax. That was a 2.3% tax on revenue, not profit. Um, so that was a particularly damaging tax, for, especially in an industry like the medical device industry where so many of the companies um, are years away from turning a profit. Even those companies that have successfully gotten through the regulatory hurdles are on market. You know, for every device that they sell is being spent to pay down all the debt that they had accumulated um, uh, and in, to pay off the investors uh, for the expense of getting that product to market. In, in under the regular U.S. tax code, because they are not profitable, they wouldn't pay a tax. But now you're putting on to the backs of, you know, small entrepreneurial companies a really, really uh, progressive tax uh, that was taking money out of the ability of these companies to continue to grow their, co to grow their companies, uh, to develop new products, uh, and was, was taking out of the device industry something on the order of magnitude about $2 billion a year. MDMA was successful in getting the tax turned off for two years at the end of 2015. And so companies have not been paying the tax in 2016 and will not pay the tax this calendar year. But absent Congress either further delaying the current suspension or outright repealing 
the tax, it gets turned back on, it snaps back on uh, January 1st of 2018. Um, the device tax was repealed under every major Republican piece of health care reform, um, but again, none of those were successful. There have been a number of bipartisan groups that have put out alternatives to those uh, Affordable Care Act repair, re repeal and, re and replace bills, and all of those bi bipartisan uh, uh, packages include full repeal of the medical device tax. Um, so it isn't an issue of we have broad bipartisan support. There's broad agreement. We've been working with your help, the help of many people on this call, to educate members of Congress about how regressive this tax is, the impact that it's had on jobs, the impact that it's had on health care, the impact that it's had on domestic manufacturing. And because of that, now we have really broad and deep support to deal with this. Um, but we've been caught up in the larger health care debate, frankly. Um, and, and now the, the, the clock is ticking, um, and we only have a couple of months to find a remedy. We, are, we work this issue every day. Uh, we have companies flying to town to hit the hill. We're going to keep doing that. Um, and, and I would say we're pretty confident that we feel like this, at a, that Congress is not going to allow the tax to go back into place. But it's going to take all of us working together to make sure to ensure that. Um, uh, and there are opportunities. A fewer and fewer, though, to get full repeal. So the likeliest outcome right now is, is probably an additional suspension, um, uh, but there are some opportunities to get full repeal, and that's what we're fighting for. Now, tax reform is an area that we've identified. I mean, tax reform is going to have a huge impact um, across the economy, uh, and it also is potentially a vehicle for dealing with the device tax. Let's jump into that. Um, why is Congress interested in tax reform? Well, as most of you know, the last time that we've done fundamental tax reform was during the Reagan administration over 30 years ago. And in those intervening years, the U.S. tax code with every year has gotten more complicated and more anti-competitive globally. And what that's meant is you have now really an epidemic of corporate inversions over the past couple of years where large companies, some large companies in, in medical technology, have inverted uh, and are now domiciled in countries that have much lower corporate rates. For example, Ireland, I believe, is at like 12 percent. So you see lots of companies at 12 percent. Well, that's a huge drain on our economy. It's a huge drain on our tax base. Um, and there's really no excuse for it other than Congress not being able to come, up, come, come to agreement on how to deal with taxes. I mean, Republicans and Democrats just fundamentally have disagreements on, on how much to tax and who to tax. But with unified Republican government, there is an expectation now, certainly on the corporate side, at a minimum, uh, that we're going to deal with our, with our corporate rate. Now, right now, the combined corporate rate in the U.S. is about 39%. Uh, that is the third highest corporate rate in the world, and it is the highest in, amongst developed countries. The average is about 22%. So we're, just, we're, we're starting off our companies, those comp U.S. companies, who stay domiciled in the U.S., many of whom now are international businesses, are just at a huge disadvantage compared to the global competitors uh, because of the taxes. So legislation is being drafted now. The intention, again, is to simplify the code, lower rates for individuals and businesses. And I'd say that, again, the stakes are incredibly high. They're, they've only been made more high by the failure of health care. Uh, Republicans in Congress, again, have to go home and sh demonstrate to voters that they've been able to accomplish something, and I think they're putting most of their eggs in the basket of tax reform right now. Unlike health care, which, you know, the administration was just getting its feet wet, they're just setting up the White House, they're thrown right into health care reform, there wasn't, it didn't appear to be lots of behind-the-scenes coordination between the Senate, the White House, and the House on what the bill should look like, what can get through Congress. They've taken a very different approach with taxes. Uh, there's a big six group, and that is made up of the two leaders on tax reform in the administration, the Treasury Secretary, the head of uh, the NEC in the White House, uh, the two leaders of the Republicans in both the House and the Senate, Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell, and then the two chairmen, the Republican chairman of the tax writing committees, uh, Kevin Brady from Texas, the Ways and Means Committee, um, and Orrin Hatch from Utah, senator who chairs uh, the Senate Finance Committee. And they've been working on kind of the principles of what this thing is going to look like. And the principles they released a couple of weeks ago, they are lower the tax rate for small businesses uh, so they compete against, compete larger, against larger ones. Again, many small businesses uh, 
are pass-throughs and they pay the highest individual rate and not the corporate rate. So there has to be some sort of equity between the individual rate and whatever is done on the corporate side. Uh, obviously, a lower tax rate on the corporate side. Um, uh, uh, unprecedented capital expensing. And then lower, you know, they want to see how low they can go, and there are going to be challenges to that. Uh, they want to create a system that encourages U.S. companies to bring jobs back here and profits back to the U.S. US right now. Because profits made overseas are exposed if you try to bring them back into the U.S. to the full corporate rate. You know, no one, uh, Apple, for example, is sitting on, you know, I, I, I can't remember the number, I think it's somewhere a billion dollars uh, overseas that they're holding overseas, and they can't bring back to the states to reinvest here uh, and, uh, unless they want to pay the full corporate rate on that stuff. Um, uh, there was a very controversial element within that that the House House Republicans were discussing as a way to pay for lowering the rate, a new tax called the Border Adjustment Tax. We won't go into tremendous detail, but to the extent some of you all have been following that and were concerned about it, uh, that has now been tabled. It will not be part of whatever proposal comes for, is nailed down. Uh, there's a priority on permanence instead of doing this stuff temporary, and they're going to move. They're going to try to move this uh, through regular order in the House and Senate. So here are just some of the questions. Again, these are the, you know, as they move from principles into actual legislative text into policy, these are the things that Republicans are going to have to struggle with. They're going to have to do it pretty quickly. You know, how low can they go? How low can they lower the, the corporate rate, for example? Um, I think last time I looked at this a few years ago, it takes something on the order of about $100 billion in new revenue, re revenue to offset a reduction in the corporate rate by 1%. So they're talking about moving this thing 15, 20%, that's going to take lots of revenue unless you increase the deficit. Uh, that raises the next question. In order for it to be permanent and to move through what is known as reconciliation, a process whereby Republicans can move legislation by a straight party line vote in the Senate uh, instead of the 60 vote threshold that would require eight Senate Democrats, um, it has to be budget neutral, uh, meaning the tax cuts can't add to the deficit. And that's going to be really tricky because it's a, it's a limited pie that they're working with. And so to come up with new revenue somewhere, that means you've got to cut out deductions that other people are availing themselves to help pay for that stuff. Uh, or potentially raise taxes. And I don't, you know, Republicans aren't known for raising taxes. So that's going to be – the math gets tricky. Is this going to be a partisan exercise? You know, right now it looks like it is. If they're going to move it through reconciliation, uh, then, you know, they don't need Democrats – um, to get to 60 in the Senate because they only need the 52 votes. And then, you know, how sustainable is something that is strictly partisan, right? That's We're working through those issues right now with Obamacare because it was passed exclusively with Democrat votes. There's a lot, to, you know, there, things just aren't politically as permanent uh, as they otherwise would be if they were passed with, by both Republicans and Democrats. Um, and then how do, you, how do you raise revenue to help pay for lowering the late rate without creating too many losers? If the current tax system is criticized for, being, uh, uh, for, for having too many winners and too many losers and not being equitable, well, by definition, as you move to a more equitable um, uh, tax regime, you're, the, some of the winners are going to become losers and some of the current losers are going to become winners. And, and all those people are political stakeholders in this process. And can they calm the stakeholders and get everybody on board with whatever the ultimate vision is for tax reform? That's an open question. Uh, and then, you know, there's, there, there's, you know, the Steve Bannon, the president's former chief strategist, he had, a, had, a, had a proposal within the White House that he was actually to help sell this to the public and so that it couldn't be criticized as providing only tax relief for the wealthy and not enough for the middle class. He was proposing as part of the pay fors to have a top rate of, I think, like 44% on income earners of $5 million or more. Now, is that realistic? You know, probably not. Uh, I think the president has already largely dismissed it, uh, but it, it does try to address one of the likely criticisms that you're going to hear from Democrats is that you know this tax reform really has to be about helping those ro those Rust Belt workers, uh, driving ec enough economic growth to help those ru Rust Belt workers, and you know and can't be can't overly advantage uh, the top one percent. So those are the issues. Uh, I raise those because those are difficult, um, and tax reform will not be easy. They're going to have to struggle with all this stuff. Uh, there, there's been, it's been reported that the president, of course, wants to do this in 2017. I think what we'll see when Congress gets back, they'll spend much of September dealing with all these must-pass bills, and I think they will begin shifting in a very public way towards tax reform. And, and the debate nationally about tax reform will really, you know, that, that's going to grow. They're going to 
go back, you know, in a more robust way, go back into their districts and across the states and sell something, put a package together. But, you know, again, I think the odds are long that they're going to be able to pass something um, uh, this calendar year. It, 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 the likeliest outcome is that they pass something in the early part of next year. Real quick, uh, MADUFA and, uh, and FDA reforms. Um, so the user fee agreement um, was just signed into law by the President last weekend, I believe. Um, uh, it was, excuse me, we've got some background noise, but uh, the user fee agreement, uh, we are, this will be the fourth iteration of our five-year user fee agreements with the FDA. Again, the purpose of these user fees is to provide the adequate resources to the FDA, um, and as long as they meet negotiated commitments on improving performance. Um, and this is, you know, MDMA was one of the negotiators at the negotiating table. Our CEO, Mark Leahy, was one of the negotiators. He's negotiated every user fee agreement, uh, making sure that our, our members uh, and that, that the industry writ large is getting a good deal. Um, uh, this will be a sizable investment. Um, uh, industry as part of this agreement, the Medufa agreement, uh, is uh, going to put up about a billion dollars, oh, just short of that, about 900 and. $90 million over five years, and new resources to the FDA for the FDA to staff up. But with that comes uh, new commitments for uh, total times uh, for the review of 510Ks and PMA applications. On the 510K side, it's going to go from 126 days to 108 days for review uh, over the five years. On the PMA side, pretty sizable change. So we're going to go from 385 calendar days to 290. Uh, those, are, those are big jumps. Uh, um, uh, and, and we anticipate that FDA with the resources will be able to deliver on those. Uh, for the first time, you're going to have goals associated with pre-submissions and de novos. Uh, for those of you on the call uh, that have uh, de novo applications pending at the FDA or have, having gone through that process with the FDA, it's been incredibly frustrating. Uh, for companies, uh, these again are products that uh, for which there is no predicate, so they cannot move through the 510K process, uh, but don't have the same safety profile as a P. Um, and so, uh, you know, in concept, it's a, it's a great program to get these novel devices um, uh, through the FDA. The problem has been because there were not fees associated with them, there, there were not goals associated with them, and so they kind of languished at the FDA. Now as part of this deal, by the end of the five-year window, 70, the FDA must have addressed 70% of all the pending de novos within 150 calendar days. Another one that we really fought for was improvements to deficiency letters. For those of you that you know interact with the FDA, uh, again, you know there's a difference between the nice to know and the need to know when you have an application pending. A lot of front line reviewers. I think there was growing concern that a lot of frontline reviewers were asking questions of the nice-to-know variety that were held, holding up applications that should have been moving more quickly forward, uh, moving forward more quickly. Uh, the now, as part of a deficiency letter, if you were to receive one, uh, any deficiencies that are raised, uh, the, the reviewer will have to include a citation uh, to either the statute or to the regs um, uh, that that. Uh, that, that point that gives them the authority to ask that question, for example. Uh, quality management programs, this is really remarkable that the FDA in 2016, I'm sorry, rather 2017, doesn't have a robust quality management system since each of you are expected by the FDA to have a robust quality management system. Uh, there are seven divisions at the FDA, over 30 branches, and depending, if you're a company that has worked with multiple branches or multiple divisions, I think m more than likely you have your, your user experience has varied greatly. You've had some branches, some reviewers that have been gang and a pleasure to work with and really easy to anticipate what they need and 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 then there have been experiences that are much more difficult um, and some of that can be dealt with with a, with a good quality management system so that um, it's not dependent on personnel that there's a process in place and that we have confidence in the process and you know reasonably what to expect when you're interacting with the FDA so as part of the user fee agreement we are financing a team of 20 quality management uh, pros who will go in and audit each of the branches and each of the divisions uh, uh, we'll identify uh, shortcomings within within each of those uh, branches and divisions, and we'll put into place an action plan on how to do 
do that, and then go back and continually audit to see to make sure that that's in place. So um, uh, we think that'll be. Uh, we are hopeful that that will have a dramatic impact uh, at the FDA. Also, as part of the agreement, you're going to have uh, new opportunities for patient engagement uh, to take the patient perspective in, um, uh, um, uh, into account uh, as um, uh, applications move through the FDA. Uh, there's a new real-world evidence pilot that is uh, started that's going to be called NEST. Um, it will be run through a coordinating center. I believe MDIC, who some of you may be familiar with, uh, has have been named the coordinating center for NEST. And that is going to really open up the opportunity to look at how can real-world evidence um, be used to leverage new efficiencies on the pre-market side. Um, and and there is interest, and there will be testing a pilot also, a very limited pilot, and only uh, companies who, um, uh, who, who, who want to do it can, will participate, and it won't be forced upon anyone. Um, but willing companies who also want to test uh, for uh, the post-market, um, the, the, the nest will be, you know, uh, will be built so that they can go in and look at uh, data that is uh, created, for example, in clinical registries to see about the performance of the device, potentially uh, uh, new indications on a device, go into things like the electronic health records to also see uh, how the device is performing. Uh, risk-based facility inspections, risk-based classification of device accessories, and then over-the-counter hearing aids. The, 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 the inspections and accessories, uh, those, you know, potentially have, you know, certainly on the inspection side uh, could be a real game changer. Uh, you know, the FDA has been criticized, for example, for having, you know, uh, uh, someone from their agriculture team heading into a device uh, facility and doing an inspection. Furthermore, uh, it wasn't a risk-based approach. You could have uh, a facility that maybe has, you know, that hasn't had an issue with an inspection in a decade. Um, and, you know, they're still being inspected. Um, and resources probably should be spent um, not that they shouldn't be expected, but in terms of frequency, maybe resources to be spent instead going to uh, facilities that don't have a sterling over record or who may be a, a new facility, for example. Um, in terms of reimbursement, this is an area, I mean, we, you know, I think when you talk to our companies, and, uh, and hopefully this has been your experience, th there are challenges at the FDA, uh, but your experience with the FDA has been improved, you know, is improving, is on the right trajectory. On, on, on the reimbursement front, uh, you know, this is, I, I don't, you know, I, I think it's, there, there are new challenges every day as it relates to reimbursement. Um, so that gap between, you know, regulatory approval at the FDA and, and a reimbursement decision has been growing. Uh, we We've been working with CMS on a proposal that is called Excite, um, and this would be one of the ways to help potentially address some of these issues. Uh, and it would conceptually, this would be provisional coverage uh, as, as as CMS's expectations for data grows. Um, you know, and small companies oftentimes it's difficult for them to secure the financing to meet those data endpoints uh, without any income or revenue, this would be a way of working through local MACs instead of a CED, for example, which is at the national level, working with local MACs for, for products that have great promise, therapies that have great promise. Uh, there would be some sort of provisional coverage, uh, an agreement between the applicant and CMS on the sort of clinical data that needed to be developed and maybe a two to three year uh, coverage to allow the company to demonstrate that they can meet those uh, clinical expectations. Um, there, obviously, you know, the challenges aren't just at CMS. Uh, there's been increasing concern about the lack of clarity uh, with private payers as it relates to coverage determinations. Uh, we helped commission a study with Tufts uh, in late 2016, and without having time to go into all the detail, it demonstrates the, the lack of consistency and patient input. Uh, in fact, I don't think any of the private payers uh, allowed for patient input uh, when they were uh, reaching their coverage determinations. So we're working on that. Uh, more transparency has continued to be needed at the CPT and RUC processes at the AMA, uh, and we have ongoing discussions with them. And then bundled payments. You know, we're in the healthcare system is moving to value, right? And and that's and, and MedTech has great promise for helping deliver value. Um, the challenge has been how do you measure value and outcomes? So instead of moving from, you know, as we move from fee-for-service fee into value-based and bundled payments, 
what are the outcomes that we're st- you know that Medicare wants to see and over what time horizon? And one of the challenges has been as it relates particularly to implantable medical devices is that oftentimes they're looking at outcomes in that first 60 to 90 days uh, from hospitalization. Um, and you may have, for example, uh, two hips um, uh, who perform identical within those 90 days because that is not the term by which you should really be judging something like a hip that is intended to be in a patient for much longer periods of time, maybe over a decade. Um, and so, you know, it could be that they score the same um, or the cheaper product, for example, scores the same over that initial uh, time horizon. But when you look at it in a more meaningful way over time, there could be huge differences between how those products perform. And unless uh, the bundles are capturing that, um, you know, who is to say that that's actually providing real value to the healthcare system? So, you know, that's, you know, the, the, the new CMS leadership, I think, is kind of hitting the pause. What we saw towards the end of the Obamacare administration, I'm sorry, the Obama administration, um, was these, these bundles, they were quote-unquote pilots, but they were nationwide and they were mandatory. And there's really nothing pilot about nationwide and mandatory. Uh, and so the new leadership at CMS very recently um, just is downsizing the complete joint replacement pilot that many of you may be familiar with. The geographic region is going to be much smaller where they deploy that. And then there was a cardiac bundle for heart attacks uh, and cardiac intervention that is being outright canceled. Um, so, you know, that's probably the direction that CMS is moving. They're not going to give up on value, but I think they're going to hit the restart button. And as we talk about value, as an industry, we just, you know, you, particularly new, new companies, you know, you're not going to get financing, frankly, unless you've thought seriously long and hard about your value proposition. There are just too many constraints in the healthcare system right now that unless you, unless you provide value, you're going to have a really difficult time getting into, uh, into the system, into, in, in, into the hospitals, into physicians' hands. And so all companies are thinking about this, but I'm bringing up value in the context of kind of congressional interest and, and really price. Um, and it, this has been driven by drug pricing, and it started with kind of the breakthrough drugs uh, for hep C that came out a couple of years ago. Those therapies were going to cost, you know, about $100,000 uh, for, uh, for that, but they were truly game changers. I mean, these were transformative. They were curative, uh, and they came with a premium cost, but they also came with giant changes in clinical outcomes and improvements to patients. What followed with that, though, um, and has 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 brought with it an intense congressional scrutiny um, are the other price hikes where you're dealing with, for example, orphan drugs like Daraprim, which was approved in 1953 um, and was acquired by Turning Pharmaceuticals, uh, the Pharma Bro, I'm sure you've watched this, who was just indicted, Martin Scarelli. He bought the drug. Uh, it was selling at $13 um, a treatment, and then overnight it went to $750. And the, the patient population that was using this is particularly sympathetic. Uh, you know, it's, it's used uh, intensely by those suffering with AIDS. Um, and so the public outcry, rightfully so, was very aggressive. We're talking every news station, front of every newspaper, um, and letters to members of Congress and town halls where members of Congress are being asked about this. Shortly after that, you had the EpiPen issue, uh, where Myelin Pharmaceuticals had brought the EpiPen onto market in 2007 at $94, and then recently was set, they were selling for $609 uh, without tremendous changes. I mean, it's, it's, it's insulin. There's innovation certainly in the pen, the auto injector, uh, but they've had a very difficult time explaining the pricing. Um, and so that's, in, that's invited tremendous scrutiny. The president himself has talked about this in his first joint address to Congress. In February, he quote unquote, he said he was going to bring down the artificial high price of drugs and bring them down immediately. Now, at, we haven't seen the follow-on action. The FDA, for example, is taking efforts right now to improve the speed, their speed, the speed by which they review uh, generics to get more generics onto the market to compete. Uh, and that has been, I think, probably the, the, the most impactful way that the administration is moving on this. But you have, this is becoming a 
difficult political situation for people on the Hill. You had, uh, as part of a, a budget vote earlier this year, you had 12 Republicans vote for reimportation. Uh, that's, you know, I think that caught a lot of people off guard in D.C. that 12 Republicans who would typically oppose reimportation, maybe, you know, one or two Republicans would support it, 12, um, uh, 12 voted to allow for imports. Um, and, you know, that puts us in a scenario now where there's great interest across kind of price transparency uh, in the healthcare system. And that's just something that we have to be prepared for. And we have to be able to articulate, and we've been doing this to policymakers about the value case of med tech. Um, and, you know, it, this isn't going away. The Democrats uh, unveiled, I think, their, econo- uh, sorry, their economic agenda probably a month and a half ago, two months ago. Part of that included one of the key components was drug pricing. Uh, they were going to create an independent panel, independent government panel, that watched pricing, that dr- uh, drug manufacturers would have to petition if they were going to raise prices annually above kind of a threshold limit, uh, and that could punish drug manufacturers with a financial penalty if they if they were you know if they gouged quote unquote, um, and they and they've also another component of that was direct Medicare negotiations, so. Um, drug pricing isn't going anywhere. Um, you know, I, I, I don't anticipate congressional action on it this year, but it is, you know, it's it's front of mind for the American public uh, and front of mind for policymakers. So making the case for the value of medical technology, you know, as a component of total health care spend, uh, we're just not what's driving health care spend. So for for the year where we have the most recent data, that's 2013, um, total health care expenditures in the U.S. were $171 billion, about 5.9% of that uh, was spent on – I'm sorry – uh, total health care expenditures were $2.9 trillion, um, $171 billion or 5.9% of that total was spent on medical technology. Uh, that's basically 6% of, um, of the total health care spend, and you'll see in that graph, that's kind of where we've been uh, going 25 years back. Um, so we're not, we're not what's moving and driving health care spend. Um, it, this drives that point home a little more clearly. This is you'll look at CPI. CPI for the for inflation in the economy is about 2.7 percent. Uh, health, the price of medical devices rise about have, have risen about 0.9 percent historically over that same 25-year uh, time horizon. So just a third of regular inflation. Uh, and then you'll see CPI for healthcare or healthcare inflation, which grows obviously at a much pronounced, much more pronounced rate than regular inflation in the economy at 4. Um, and, and this bears out when you start looking at an individual product. So the prices for implantable medical devices, those are typically the more expensive medical devices. They, those drop those, those drop over time. Uh, the, the industry is competitive enough that we have you know lots of device makers working on uh, solutions to the same uh, uh, same unmet clinical needs um, and 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 competing against one another. And so you look at something a game changer like the drug eluding stent that came on market. It came on at three thousand dollars. Uh, this now sells for you know a third of that, um, and and that's not the I mean price isn't the only point. I'm just raising that you know there's interest in price, but there's there's also we, there's there's the value of medical technology isn't in the price alone. It's the how does it drive value in the rest of the healthcare system, and it you know it doesn't it's. It follows logically that that advances in medical technology, particularly the number of advances that that have have made surgeries less invasive and have reduced hospitalization, which is one of the top drivers in healthcare cost, um, uh, are, are are driving cost out of the system as a value add to the system, um, and so. Um, uh, you know that's you know as you're as you're as we're engaging with policymakers, it's just important to kind of continue to bring them back to the healthcare. You know, people are living longer uh, and more fulfilling lives because of advances in medical technology, and people are getting out of the hospital more quickly because of advances in medical technology. So with that, we'll conclude. Um, you know, the, the the question, and it's an open question, is you know, can this White House deliver on a really big agenda? Um, and can they deliver on it with the Republican divisions that already exist, um, that are made that 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 the that the administration or the president has made more pronounced by you know calling out individual Republicans, um, with a narrowed majority in the Senate and with really unified Democrat opposition, um, and you know that's that's a, that's a tall order. Um, 
as it relates to the device tax, again, you know, through our collective work, we have really strong bipartisan support. It's critical that we come up with a solution in the next couple of months. We are hopeful that one exists towards the end of the year. Um, and uh, so the prospects for for additional relief are good, uh, but not guaranteed. Uh, lots of opportunities the FDA. Uh, serious challenges remain uh, in the reimbursement environment. And, you know, each of you really just have a great story to tell. Uh, and so we hope that we can either help you with that or that you will start engaging on your own with your policymakers because we're kind of the trifecta. You know, we're, we're, we are domestic manufacturing. We're high tech and innovation, uh, and we're improving healthcare, um, and we're improving the lives of patients. And, and frankly, many of the policymakers are users of our medical technology. So it's important for you to engage. So with that, I think I've gone over the hour mark. I will open it up to a couple of questions. All right. Thanks so much, Clayton. Um, we'll begin the Q&A session. If you have a question, please feel free to submit it using the Q&A panel located at the bottom right of your screen. After typing a question in the space at the bottom, hit the send button. Make sure you direct your questions to all panelists in the Ask menu. Um, so a couple that have kind of come in here while you've been talking, I think you covered this, but maybe can you restate whether you believe the reduced fees for small device companies will continue? Yeah, so that so again, that was part of um, when when MDMA was founded, we were founded really over the issue of user fees, and this was in 1992. There were a number of people in the industry, a number of companies in the industry that, you know, despite poor performance at the FDA, wanted to start paying fees as a way to improve the FDA. And I think there were another group of companies led by the the founding members of MDMA that said, you know, not so fast. We've got to, the FDA really needs to demonstrate that it can reform and get its house in order, and then we'll have that discussion about providing uh, providing fees. Part of those when we when when MDMA finally agreed to sit at the table and start negotiating user fees, you know, one of our top priorities was making sure that there was a significant carve out for small businesses, uh, and that that small business definition was large enough to capture lots of med tech companies. So you'll be pleased to know over time we've gotten that small business definition raised, I think, from about 30 million to currently 100 million in sales. So if you are a company with less than with 100 million dollars or less in sales, you pay about a quarter of the traditional. 510k fee. So the fee under this proposal is about $10,000. I think it's $900-996. Um, the 510k fee will be $2,499. On the PMA side, uh, obviously a much more in-depth uh, process at FDA, so it's more expensive, but Regular co companies that make over $100 million will pay the full fee of $294,000. Uh, small businesses under, you know, at or under that $100 million uh, limit will pay about a quarter of that, $73,000. So yes, we've been, we continue to fight for the small business exemption as an important part of the current user fee agreement, and we expect it to be in place for quite some time. Great. Thank you. Um, could you speculate on the future of Trump's one-in, two-out executive order and what effect that will have on medical device regulations in particular? So yeah, there was a there was a lot of concern about this at the beginning of the year, as there was with the hiring freeze government wide. The impacts have not been severe or really seen at all. The hiring freeze has been lifted, and as it relates to the one in two out, um, you know there hasn't been an official announcement, uh, but agencies haven't stopped issuing new regulations or proposing new regulations. I think part of that is you know there are lots of regulations on the books. Um, uh, that just, you know, are, are outdated and, and, you know, there's plenty of places for them to go to go get those two, uh, uh, two out, uh, one new in. So, I, I, you know, again, there's been no formal announcement um, unless someone on the call is aware of specific instances where this is, we're, we're, we have not been made aware of through our membership of specific instances where this has been a, a real hindrance on the, you know, issuing new regulations. Great. Thank you. I think we'll go ahead and stop there, uh, given that we're a little bit over the hour. Thank you so much for such a comprehensive presentation. I know this was such a crucial update for our listeners and our policyholders, so thank you, Clayton.